You're listening to a mighty fortress. Welcome to Mighty Fortress. I am your host, Night Jake. Over these few weeks, we're going to be going through a presentation that John Mackay gave at the St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Handorf. Now, this talk was organised by Pastor Bob Seidel on behalf of the St. Matthew's Independent Lutheran Church in Handorf, but they met together at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Here, John Mackay gave a presentation regarding the six days of creation. Now I've recorded this entire talk and I've broken it up into three parts and over these three episodes we will be listening to this talk in its entirety. Uh, the sound quality is not the best so bear with me but I hope you enjoy the talk. It's well worth listening to. We're going to take just a couple of questions here because if you're struggling with the age of things or the rocks uh, or just some of the, the biblical teaching we dealt with before we go into looking at the days of Genesis then here's a chance just to raise a couple of issues and uh, clarify the issue and then we'll move on to part two. Anyone got any questions on anything we've said thus far? Yes mate? It's not about what you said but is there a link between um, uh, fossilized wood, a petrified wood and, and the Great Flood? Is there a link between petrified wood and the Great Flood? <clears throat> well, you came up to Jurassic Ark, so I'll ask you to tell them how good you think it is in a moment. Um, nothing better than a personal witness there. But Jurassic Ark was first started because we found a whole pile of fossil trees. Right? But what's interesting about those fossil trees is they're squashed. Now, what most people don't realise, unless they've been farmers who've cleared a paddock, if you take your big D8, and you knock a tree over and you run over that tree, you may have noticed that the tree shatters, right? It doesn't squash. But if you're a boat builder, you've learned how to squash trees. What you do is soak them in superheated water. And then if you just even steam them, you can bend them. And that's how you build curved wooden boats. Steaming the wood actually makes it pliable. So when you dig up a squashed fossil tree that hasn't shattered, you know, number one, it's been full of water. Number two, the weight that was on it has actually been incredible. Because even when you get and you take one board and you try and turn it, you'll find you have to exert an incredible amount of pressure even on one board. And we've run the experiment to see how many tons per square inch or per square centimetre you actually have to put on a log to compress the log so that instead of being nice and round it's flat right? and many of the trees at our foot fossil tree deposit have definitely been saturated, they've been compressed to the point of being heated and then squashed. Uh, when you look at the size of that bed, the bed alone that we're working on at, at Gympie at our Jurassic Art Creation Museum goes from North Queensland down to the Opal Fields out to the border of South Australia, and right on the edge of the Flinders Ranges, and back up to the Gulf of Carpentaria. Right, that's how many fossil trees we've got in Queensland in this bed. So if you then ponder, hey, if those trees don't have roots, then they grew somewhere else. And if they grew somewhere else and were picked up and destroyed and then dumped, then you're talking about a huge catastrophic flood. But if you want to petrify a tree, <coughs> which is what you've asked, I guess you could try it the slow way and drip limestone on it, like we're doing out in the open, but trees are actually notorious for one thing. Alive or dead, they've got channels through them. You know when you cut a rose, and then you put it in a vase, you put water in the vase, what's the water for? Keeps the rose alive. But if you want to know where the water goes, get a white rose, put the water in the vase, and add some red food colour because you find the red food colouring goes up the stem and out into the flowers. It goes from the bottom to the top. And a tree is just a gigantic stem. And what you find is one of the minerals that the tree absorbs while it's alive is iron. Aren't some of you farmers? Don't you add iron shelates to your ground and things? That trees love iron. But if you pick up a log that's petrified, it's heavy because of iron and other minerals. 
If you are a good farmer, you'll add silica to your soil as well. You know, diatomite soil really enhances a lot of your farm. So what you find is the trees will absorb this too, alive or dead. And then if you get it compressed and the water is on the outside and the water is under pressure, it actually dissolves silica out of the mud and the sand and it will push it into the, the cavities and all of a sudden you have a petrified tree. If you want to know how long this takes, remember back to the days when we only chopped down trees of hardwood to make fence posts. You don't need to do all that hard work anymore. You can buy green, rounded, nice pine ones, correct? Anyone know what the green is? It's a copper salt, right? And you know what we've learned to do? Put that thing in a high pressure injector and pump the copper into it like that. And it's preserved. Well, if we were to add a few more chemicals, we could sell you petrified lots. But the way to carry it around is simply, it's like the people who said, why don't you sell teddy bears through the post? I said, well, it's cheap enough to make the teddy bear because they're so heavy, the post is be incredible. Um, you petrify something <coughs> and it turns to stone. So yes, there is a connection between burial of trees, flood deposition, and injection of high pressure water rich with minerals because of the amount of sediment that's been dumping. Since you've been to Jurassic Art, return the favour, tell them what it's like. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, I met John 50 years ago and he addressed my social studies group at Concordia College as a guest speaker. And uh, it's been an interval of 50 years and we have re-established contact on a recent trip to Queensland. Like we in myself <coughs> intentionally um, went to Jurassic Art uh, and John Gates guided tour there and I was most impressed. Now the question um, in my mind is if the earth is young and Genesis is true, what could you observe to prove well, John's <coughs> museum is unique in the world that showcases the evidence for it. It's also, there's things that stuck in my mind, um, for instance, evolution has say that uh, you know, uh, fish turn into land animals and so forth. And John shows how kind didn't uh, change, for instance, it's vermilion plants. A whole variety of vermilion plants and yet they're uh, just one point of change. There's a whole lot of things there. I was interested in a lot of fossilised rock there. Um, little experiments in um, a fish tank that uh, little lengths of wood to simulate logs. So they float into the water first. After a while, they float in a, uh, a vertical position and then they sink to the bottom, simulating how concentrate fossils stand up like. Um, in some way. Um, there's a whole, whole range of things there. Uh, and it's about 12 pages out of the people. So you'd recommend they come sometimes? Yeah, yeah, I recommend Bring a bus load. Yeah, you, have to, you have to talk to John if you want to know what you Yeah. Okay, the map's actually on the web now. Um, if you go to creationresearch.net, click the museum icon, and uh, actually then just scroll down to Jurassic Ark. Again, a reminder. If you have got questions and you're not brave enough to ask them on this subject particularly, which is one of the most commonly asked questions about God and evolution and the days of Genesis, the age of the earth, etc. Just press the Q&A button and they'll come up. You will get one last chance uh, after this section to have some questions and then of course you can talk to me personally uh, as we have supper, etc. Yes, sir. Uh, I just uh, uh, to point out an observation quite some years ago now. The chap in the 1840s, uh, a chap he dug a well and actually lined it with tumors. And then for some reason or other, uh, the water dried up and so they decided to fill it in so the animals wouldn't fall in. And then probably about 90 or so years later, um, someone else actually bought the property and they decided I heard about this well and they decided to uh, uh, resurrect it, took all the dirt out, 
and then come across some of these timbers and they thought, hmm. So they took it down to the experts and uh, uh, he said, how old do you reckon that is? And they did some tests and that and oh yeah, so many millions of years old. And he said, you realise that you've destroyed what you've actually been trying to tell people because that that was actually lined in 1842. Yeah, this is not a rare experience. If you actually go to Venice, uh, Venice is originally built on big poles into the mud, but because it's been sinking or the mud's been rising, take your pick, sometimes hard to tell which, um, you will find that those poles have been totally entrapped and out of air and out of the reach of bugs for a long time now and quite a large number of them have turned to stone, right? Just in the past few hundred years, it's not a long-term phenomena, it's a process. Not time, but process. Okay, part two. I'm going to offer a free book. Up there. I was asked to do a debate against a professor at Southampton University, and he was a professor of physics. And I said, well, what will we debate about? And he said, let's debate whether Genesis 1 to 11 is literal. And I sort of thought, is this guy an idiot? He wants to debate me on Genesis, and he's an atheist. I said, if you want to debate on that, I'll be happy to debate you on that. There's a book up the back that I found very helpful in preparing that, that debate. It's this one. It's an in-depth study, so don't get it unless you want to really do an in-depth study. It's by a guy with his doctorate in geology and a guy with his doctorate in theology. It's a look at Genesis on how do you know how it's meant to be written. It's like when you have a look at a stop song. Most of us don't ponder, I wonder if it actually means stop. Is it literal? Um, do you ever say, is that stop sign symbolic? Now, you don't even ponder how you should read something, but in reality, when you start analysing literature, you actually do need to ask questions like that. Oh, and what does that mean? You, you, nobody's won this, by the way. Now you'll have to spend $25 or something. It's a fabulous book. I'll tell you. That's Genesis 1 before 600 BC. Do you realise we have copies of Genesis way back? If you have a look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are 46 commentaries alone on Genesis. It was an important book, even to the Essene society before Jesus Christ. Let me help you. You're more familiar with... Well, no, you're not, are you? Because you don't read Hebrew. You say, what's a geologist doing putting Hebrew up in front? Um... I discovered a few things over the years. I um, actually got around me a, group, a team of people, including two Hebrew scholars. Uh, both of them were university lecturers. And I said to these guys, I said, listen, it's one thing for me to beat people over the head in arguments with fossils. It's one thing for me to win a debate about the age of rocks. But I need to know what you guys are talking about. Teach me some Hebrew. And I really did enjoy uh, just sitting there and listening and asking them questions at a pragmatic level. You will notice one thing, those of you who don't know Hebrew started reading at the other end. They read from right to left. Don't ask me why, nobody knows the answer to that. Um, English, we read from left to right. But you see the ones I boldened? That's the word we're interested in. You see, there's the modern Hebrew script. Um, there it is, transliterated. Notice we've got the five over this side. We've turned the Hebrew script into English style letters and there's the word. You might have uh, in discussions about how long is a day, because this is Genesis 1-5, have discovered that you say that word something like yom or yom. You know, it depends what Hebrew school you went to. There it is in English. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and morning was the first day. So I've made up a title for this section. Here it is. Let's just call it a day. Oh, actually the Bible says that's what it was called in the beginning. You see, it's interesting that God actually gives it a name. God said, let the light be called day and the darkness be called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. So what we're going to be doing now is have a look at how you can actually read this. Um, I get to travel through many, many cultures. I get to lecture in many, many universities around the planet. So I've had to learn how to cooperate with linguists who have to translate what I'm saying. 
I remember being in one culture and after my first couple of sentences as a well-spoken Aussie, my translator said, stop please sir. I said, well, what's the problem? Would you please stop speaking in phrases? You know, the dog said, we will go out to the yard. I thought that would make it easy for them. And, and he said, we have our verbs at the end of the sentence. And unless you get to the verb, I don't know what you mean. Oh, how do I do this? Oh, don't speak in phrases, because many of our phrases don't have verbs, correct? So you don't have a clue what the phrase meant. Amazing. All right. In English, and the evening and the morning was the first day. The word in orange, day, there is the Hebrew word yom. Um, so we put it in there for you. You want to have arguments? That's the one that will show up over and over again. <clears throat> and one of the first things that people tell you is, yom can actually mean any time. Now because we're in a Lutheran church building tonight, it's really good to remind you that one thing we can give credit to Martin Luther for is reminding us that if you want to know what Genesis means, compare it with the similar things in Exodus. Compare it with Deuteronomy. Check it out in Nehemiah chapter 9 and cross-reference all of what you're saying. In fact, didn't he come up with some concepts about soul or something or other? Yeah, scripture against scripture. Okay, can yom mean any time? How would you figure this out? Not by having arguments in English. What you need to say is, let's check how this word is translated, even in your English Bibles or your German Bibles, in different positions. The book of Leviticus, chapter 23, on the tenth yom of the seventh month, there shall be a yom of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you will afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, and you will do no work in that same yom, for it is a day of atonement. Ah, notice one thing. In those two verses, the word day is mentioned four times. So when you have a think, okay, if I check the context here, I'll get a better picture of what the word day means. Hmm, okay, help you. You've heard of the Day of Atonement? Good. Uh, you'll see it there in English. You'll also see it in Hebrew. But some of you should know what the Hebrew for this is because there was a famous battle on this day. The Egyptians thought the Jews would all be having a day of rest. It's a holy day. The Orthodox Jews who ran the nation said, we must have a rest, Yom Kippur. By the way, what a shock they got when they raided Israel and got their teeth kicked in. Yeah, the famous battles of Yom Kippur in Israel are intriguing. But if you go to Israel today and ask a rabbi, a trained Hebrew speaker, when the Day of Atonement is, when is Yom Kippur, he'll tell you it's on the 10th day of Tishri. Yeah, that's this year. 5777, five, oh, there's that AC system again. In Israel, it's still not 6,000 years since the creation. Intriguing. You see, that translates to October the 11th of 12 in 2016. You say, how can one day be two days? Oh, think carefully. You're an Orthodox Jew. You believe Genesis is real history. And God said, let the light be called day and the darkness be called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. When does a Jewish day start? In the evening, six o'clock. Well, sunset to be literally right. Um, it's a bit of a pain sometimes, particularly if you have daylight saving. You really ruin all these sort of schemes. Um, but in reality, they start when the sun sets right through to the next sunset. The English, Anglican, Germanic system starts in the middle of the night, correct? And uh, I tell you what, if you're trying to figure out Easter, <laughs> It, it makes for headaches, doesn't it? Because Jesus killed on the Thursday, was it the Friday? When did the day start? What do you call Friday? What did the Jews call Friday? You can have some interesting dilemmas because of this six hour delay. Okay, and if you then ask the question, how long is Yom Kippur? The answer is 24 hours. So the reality is if you go to Israel today and you ask them what they mean by Yom, the answer is 24 hours. Well, actually 23 hours, 59 minutes and about 52 seconds. The orthodox value of the day astronomically. You want to make some more comparisons? Exodus chapter 20. <clears throat> In six yoms, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Hmm. Source of this? 
Careful. Was Moses sitting up on Mount Sinai wondering what to tell the Jews? I mean, that is what Muhammad has done. He's invented a religion to tie together warring tribes and give them a modus operandi, give them a, an intention. Now, the Bible never mentions Moses trying to come up with a racial uh, program up on Mount Sinai. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, keep the Sabbath, for it's holy to you, for in six yoms. Do you realize the six yom bits shows in Genesis, shows in Exodus 20, shows in Exodus 20, 31, shows in Deuteronomy 5? It's repeated. You can't miss it. It's there. Okay. Notice the introduction. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, now, this section of the Bible is also known as the Ten What? Commandments. Is there a commandment that says, Thou shalt not lie? You will tell the truth? Yeah, there is. Question. If this God did not say this, and Moses, who writes the commandment about telling the truth, did say this, but he actually said God said it, then it's a lie. You see, this is a statement that's either right or wrong. This is a statement that's like a stop sign. It doesn't have a poetic meaning. I mean, you try that argument with the policeman who's giving you a ticket for going through a stop sign. And, and you, you won't get anywhere. I mean, you went through the red light, you went through the stop sign, the policeman leaps out from behind a phone box, pulls you up and says, Sir, do you realise you didn't stop? <coughs> What's your argument? Oh, but officer, I slowed down. Oh, he says, but slowing down isn't stop. Oh, but you see, it was my intention. And the officer gets out his rubber baton and begins to beat you rapidly over the head. And you say, stop, stop. And he said, you want me to stop or just slow down? <laughs> you realise the word stop has no symbolic meaning ever. It's either true or it's false. Likewise here, that first statement is not capable of having a poetic or a symbolic meaning in any way. We'll take questions a bit later. Um, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, keep the Sabbath, because if it didn't mean what it said, then Moses is a liar. And if Moses is a liar, the God he's talking about is a liar, because he said the God said it, and he didn't. By the time you get to Exodus 31, you notice something else. The Lord gave to Moses, when they'd finished talking, two tablets of testimony, the tables of stone. How are they written? That's a statement that's either true or it's false. Is not capable of any other means of interpretation whatsoever. You see, many people are trained to be so flexible in the thinking, they think anything can be symbolic. No, it can't. You see, you need to understand what symbols actually are. I'll give you an illustration. Have you heard the word radar? Okay. One of the linguists who I discussed this with, he made a very good analogy. He said, when all words start, they first of all have to be literal. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, take the words we've invented like radar. Okay, do you remember what, ra some of you are old enough, you remember when radar was invented? It wasn't a little black box you put in the front of the plane. In fact, didn't most of the pilots not know what it was? They just knew that it showed up the enemy. Didn't know how it worked. It was a magic thing. It was radar. Of course, radar was short for radio, aerial detection, whatever. But the word radar, in the end, meant a little, literal black box. By the time you get past World War II, let's go down to the Korean War. Some of you are old enough to have misspent your youth watching TV programs like MASH. Agree? Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the guy who uh, worked the radar set? Radar. But he wasn't radar, was he? You see, his association was he could hear the helicopters coming before anybody else. He was an early warning system just like radar. So they gave him the nickname radar. So by the Korean War, radar had moved from being a literal thing to being actually a symbol of something. Now you get to 2016 and the elders and the deacons decide to have an annual church meeting. But the pastor says to some of the elders and the deacons on the inside, we have to sneak a few things under the radar before the congregation finds out. Oh, not this church, of course. Do you realise what's just happened? The words move from being a literal noun to being a symbol 
question. When you have a church meeting, is there any lit radar anywhere? What does he actually mean? It's got nothing to do with literal radar. Now the concept is so widely understood, you can make it a metaphor. So nothing can be a symbol by itself. It has to have a history of starting out literal, then it has to go to metaphor, then, uh, then, it, then it can, sorry, has to go to symbol, and only in the end can it ever become a metaphor. Don't be surprised Jesus said this and he meant it literally. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he actually wrote about me. Question. If Moses didn't write the things you read in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, Jesus is lying. Because that statement is not capable of being interpreted symbolically either. But since you do not believe what Moses wrote, notice how he repeats it? You can't miss it. He firmly is of the conviction that Moses wrote this. And not only that, this is the Jesus who said, I am the way, I am the... Oh, interesting. You see, the point here, in the end, becomes Jesus' integrity. And in case you haven't got the point, let me help you. Can you spot the difference in the following? IQ test. I am remaking a point. You understand? Um, am I remaking the point? Or am I remaking one point? Or um, how about remaking the first point? Question. Are they actually saying all the same thing? No. Nelly, but not quite. You see, it could be my first point, which would be one point, and it is the point if it was a point. But it might not be a point at all. It might be your point, but it might be a lousy point. Ah, interesting. Let's help you. Let's revise something. You can tell God called me to be a teacher because I sort of teach people until I get the point. Um, there's our words again in Hebrew, modern Hebrew. There it is transcribed reading from the left you can see it as yom there and in genesis 5 which is the verse we're interested in the first occurrence of this word yom oh hang on that's interesting and god said let the light be called day you take genesis literally who invented the word day god did and the first time a word that we know of is ever used in any language we've experienced it is always literal it has no possibility of being anything else. That's interesting. Because it doesn't matter whether the language is Hebrew or English, every language on the planet works like that. And this is the invention of the thing you call day, or the Hebrews call yom, or other languages call something else. But it's not the necessarily talking about it in Hebrew, it's the invention of the term. Literal translation, one day, well... But hang on, that's not how your Bible reads. That's the literal translation. I'll help you a bit. And God called the light day and the darkness into night, and there was evening and there was morning, one day. Now you'll find some Bible translations are brave enough to put that in. But if you're English speaking or thinking, the problem is you don't think that way. Because if God made one day and there never been another day before, then this one day must be the first day, correct? That's how the English speak. You do realize when the Bible, Bible translators translate a, a language uh, into your language, they have to take your culture into consideration? Have you ever pondered how you would translate the New Testament into Papua New Guinea tribal languages? Um, I am the good shepherd. How do you say that to a society that doesn't have sheep? It's rather difficult. So you have to sort of cheat a bit around the edges to illustrate this. I remember one missionary who now works for us, he shared a fascinating story about the problems involved in translating the Bible from Greek or Hebrew into Pidgin English or native languages. He took the American head of his mission board to visit one of the chiefs. And uh, the chief offered them lunch. The chief had become a Christian. And this was a really nice lunch. Uh, and the meat was delightful. And the, the missionary said to the chief, um, what meat are we eating? And the chief said, oh, sheep, sheep. And they pondered that and seen a sheep in the hole in New Guinea. It's jungle, it's hot, it's, the sheep don't do well there. So anyway, being polite, they ate the rest of the meal. And then uh, he asked again, now, now chief, what meat was this? Oh, sheep, sheep. And then they got brave enough and he said, what kind of sheep? And the chief said, 
she'd go woof 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 <laughs> ah you see that was the closest they could get but how would you translate I am the great dog keeper <laughs> no no that doesn't quite make it does it so sometimes when you're translating to another language you have to be very creative <laughs> in finding a solution how do the English think? No, don't think in terms of one day, because if this was one day and there was none before, this was the first day, that's how it's easy to follow and understand. But you see, here's the point. See that little word there? We can have an argument in English about the fact that this mentions numbers like first, this mentions numbers like one, this mentions adjectival qualifications, evening and morning. It's a description. But I'm only going to concentrate on that number, Yom Ikar. God made one day. There'd never been a day made before. Therefore, this one day is also the first day, so why make a point of it? Actually, the point is very simple. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. Do you know that psalm at all? Yeah, turned into a nice chorus. And most of us, when we sing that chorus, here's how we think. Monday's the day, Tuesday's the day, which is rubbish. The Lord only ever made one day, and it was the first day of the week. That's the day the light shone into the darkness. That was the day, we call it the Lord's Day, don't we? The first day of the week. That was the day the Lord made. In fact, on the first day of the week, didn't the light shone in the darkness? Didn't Jesus rise from the dead? Oh, and that's the day to rejoice in. In fact, the sovereignty of God put into Genesis chapter 1, day 1, the whole picture of the light shining into the darkness so you could actually see the light of salvation. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, for God who commanded the light to shine has shone in our hearts the light of the glory of God through the face of Jesus Christ. He tied the gospel to Genesis chapter 1, day 1. You see, we know this psalm is about Jesus because he quotes from it and he really upset everybody. You know, when he, he's, he's telling them a story about an owner of a vineyard and they kill the servants and they finally kill the son. And then he says, the owner of the vineyard comes and he takes it away and he gives it to others. Now, if you're wondering why they got so mad at Jesus and they picked up stones to stone him, back in Isaiah, you find God himself defining Israel as my own vineyard. They knew he was having a shot at them. And if he was going to take the vineyard away from them, then he'd have to take it away from God. But the only person who could take it away from God would be God. So this was blasphemy. So Jesus finishes off his story and he says, the stone the builders rejected has been made the headstone of the corner. And then he goes on and he says, for this is the day the Lord has made. We'll be glad and rejoice in it. And Jesus was crucified, put in the grave on the seventh day, and on the first day of the week, which is the day the Lord made, who rose from the dead? Jesus. The light shone in the darkness. And the disciples were so overjoyed. They, they, actually, that is what the gospel says. They rejoiced on the day the Lord has made. You see, this is not just an interesting side issue about the number one. This is also about salvation. In fact, there's more. Don't go away. Don't go to sleep yet. Let's try and rush it through because I don't want to bore you to death, particularly you theological students there. Behind yourself. Thank you for listening 